Grace and peace be to you through God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome all who are with us as we worship on this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. Good morning. Good morning. Let us begin our time of worship by singing step by step. Gracious and loving God, 
we give you thanks once again for the gift of possibility that comes to us in this day. We thank you for this time put before us. We thank you for this time where we are able to offer our worship and praise, to be in conversation with you, to listen to what you have to say to us this day. We give you thanks for the opportunities afforded to us to not only worship, but to rest, to recreate and recreate. We pray that you would help us to take advantage of the time given to us to consider our priorities and to order them according to the ways of your kingdom. Help us to seek the things that make for healing and wholeness in this world. We lift up in our prayers those whose needs include the need for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We lift up those who work with those who suffer from brokenness or caregivers and those in the healing professions. We lift up in our prayers those who suffer brokenness, not of just of body, but also of mind and spirit. For those who have suffered loss, the disruption and rupture of relationships, loss through death, we pray that your presence may give healing and hope to those who are seeking to rebuild out of the broken pieces. And we lift up before you, no, in the silence of our hearts, those concerns that we can only bring to you there. the things we have named aloud and for those things which each of us have brought to you in the silence of our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our reading from Hebrew scripture this day comes to us from the words of the psalmist in Psalm 27, verses 11 and 14. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Our epistle lesson comes to us from the letter to the Colossians, the third chapter, verses 12 through 17. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in the one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And our gospel lesson comes to us from Luke's gospel, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Thus ends the reading of our scripture. May God add a blessing to our hearing of it. We now continue with special music from the Salem Ensemble, Come Unto Me.
Thank you, Salem Ensemble, for sharing the gift of music with us this morning. Not long ago, a few weeks back, I saw a commercial. Maybe some of you saw it as well. It came from one of the wireless phone carriers, and it talked about the perils of incomplete phone coverage and messages breaking up. And in this particular spot, there was a woman trying to select what clothing she was going to wear for a business function. And she was talking to a co-worker of hers on the phone and saying she was having difficulties making a decision. And the co-worker said, just remember this is a business meeting, not a costume party. Don't go crazy. Well, because the transmission got garbled and she only heard part of the message, what she had heard instead was, remember, this is a costume party. Go crazy. And so she shows up to this business dinner looking like she had come straight out of a Renaissance fair. Perhaps one of the more embarrassing things to happen. You know, dress does matter one way or the other. And to prove that, I think we need to look no further at what happens when we get invited to some kind of social function among people that we don't know very well. And what's the first question that we usually ask? How are people dressed? How formal of an occasion is this? You don't want to come too formally dressed, but on the other hand, far worse, you don't want to come dressed well enough for the occasion. Now, Scripture does not make a lot of case for what we ought to be wearing on the outside. I mean, there are a couple exceptions to that. If a person is in mourning, they need to dress appropriately for mourning. And if a person is invited to a festive deal like a wedding feast, uh, they need to come appropriately tired with a wedding robe on. Those of you who are familiar with the Gospels remember what happened to the wedding guest that did not show up with a robe and how he was treated and all of that. But more importantly than what we put on our bodies, what our physical covering looks like, Scripture is much, much more concerned about what goes on on the inside, how we clothe ourselves spiritually. And what does God ask of the people of Israel in the book of the prophet Joel, in chapter 2, verse 13. Rend your hearts and not your garments. If you indeed are going to make a confession and turn your life around, that needs to come from the inside, not just by rending and tearing your garments and grief. What goes on on the inside makes a difference. And so, how do we look at, how do we dress in this particular time that we are in, these last 18 months of pandemic? How does one dress for a pandemic? Well, I'm not going to concentrate on the things that we put on our body and the things that we put on our face. I am not going to talk, for example, of things like this mask and this covering. Uh, not where we're going with all with that, if you're wondering by the title of the sermon. Instead, I look to the things that are the things that we put on spiritually, the things that we need to take on in an internal matter rather than an external matter. And in Paul's letter to the Colossians in chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, he gives us an idea about that. He says that we ought to clothe ourselves spiritually in compassion, humility, meekness, kindness, and patience. And that above all else, we need to clothe ourselves in love, which perfectly binds all things together. That in this time, we do need to show kindness, meekness, humility, forbearance, patience in all of these things with other people. Because goodness knows, over these last 18 months or so, 
people have found themselves stressed by one thing or another. Uh, They've either been subjected to high levels of anxiety and uncertainty about uh, things that go on in almost every aspect of their lives, from their work lives to, can I find enough basic supplies of food and toilet paper and all that stuff? And people sometimes find themselves impatient. They can find themselves crabby and short of patience in all of these things. And what do we do? How do we respond to that? We need to remember that everybody has a story. Everybody has a burden that they carry with them. That story, that burden may not be readily apparent to a lot of people, or most people for that matter, but we need to remember that everybody carries with them something that may be hidden from the rest of the world. And certainly, we all need to show patience and forbearance and forgiveness with one another because we ourselves may have been short We ourselves may have been impatient with other people, and we need to remember that. Now, back four years ago, I was finishing up my last segment of sabbatical leave. And as I did during the first chunk in 2017, I did it in the last chunk of 2017, was on Sunday mornings, I would go to another house of worship on Sunday morning. You know, some people say, may say, well, why, why didn't you come here to worship? Well, some of that should be obvious. If I come back here, that pretty much ended sabbatical leave. You leave to go away. You come back, you get drawn into things. But, but more importantly, I've got colleagues in other churches, and it'd be good to see what their work looks like. I don't get to see much of that having a regular gig on Sunday morning. So, I decided I would go and visit neighboring churches of people that I knew to see what was going on. Unfortunately, I had some really weird luck with some of these things. Every time it seemed that I wanted to go to a place where a colleague was serving, they weren't preaching on that Sunday morning. Somebody else was doing something, or I missed a special event by a week or so. And so it went. On this particular Sunday in October... Four years back, I went over to Christian Life Assembly of God. And talk about timing, I I got there not on the day when they were first celebrating worship in their new constructed worship space, but I caught worship on the last Sunday in the old space. But that kind of worked out, as it turned out, okay. Because as they were preparing to make that transition, I thought that pastors Rich and Sharon York did a very wise thing in all of that. And they mentioned that during the time of construction, people were working hard, people had their noses to the grindstone, trying to meet deadlines, trying to get everything straight. And it was acknowledged that perhaps in the midst of all of that work and in all of that pressure, people may not have always dealt kindly and patiently with one another. Uh, that people may have been cranky and surly and rude in, in some of those cases, not meaning to be, but you know, people being people, sometimes that happens. And he said, perhaps as they get ready to move into the new worship space, it would be a good thing to remember that, to acknowledge that, that we are people that not only need forgiveness, but more importantly, need to extend that forgiveness to other people. And the way that they symbolized that was that they had communion that particular morning. Now, from what I remember, and I I could be wrong, perhaps, but communion, I don't believe, is celebrated as much in that particular congregation or as often. And so, to do that, they... They passed out those little combination wafer and wine things that we use now during the pandemic. They used on this particular day. It was my first experience, by the way, with one of those. And I thought, yeah, this is a really good idea. 
it stresses the need for us to put on compassion, kindness, humility, patience, all of that, and to remember that we need to clothe everything in love, that we are people in need of forgiveness and we are people that need to forgive. Those things are very important to put on, particularly in a time of pandemic when stress is high and patience is low. But I thought there was something else that needed to be put on as well and didn't come necessarily from the text in Colossians, but came instead from another text in the Gospel in Luke chapter 18. It's an odd story. It's a story which Luke tells us Jesus told because he needed to remind his disciples of the need to be persistent in prayer and to keep at praying. And he told the story of a judge in a certain town who was, did not fear God, did not respect human beings. He, he didn't really care one way or the other about those things which should be important. And anyway, there was also a widow in that certain town who kept coming to him all the time with the request, grant me justice against my opponent's. And for a while, this judge decided that he was going to do nothing. But eventually, he said to himself, even though I do not fear God or respect human beings, I will grant this widow her request because she is so persistent that she doesn't wear me out by pestering me. Now, it's an odd story because you wonder, what's the point that Jesus is trying to make here? Is God like this you know, good-for-nothing judge who only relents after being pestered in prayer all of the time? Is that the point that Jesus is trying to make? No, that, that's not what Jesus is trying to say. What he is saying by comparison is that even if a no good-for-nothing judge like this will react to pressure and persistence, how much more will a perfectly loving God be willing to grant the request of prayers to children who ask continually? Not to say that the prayer, I think, bends the will of God. I don't think that happens. But it does change us. It does bend our will to God's will. It eventually gets us looking at the things that are most important and the things that matter most to God. It may not get us the things that we want, but prayer may, in time, being persistent, give us the things that we need. We keep asking for patience, understanding, forgiveness, the ability to be compassionate, I think these are things that God is more than willing to grant, but we have to be persistent in that as we, as we bend our will to God's will. Persistence in prayer is something that we should clothe ourselves with as well in times such as this. No, people have been, have been challenged, their patience runs low, they have become irritable the best antidote that we have for that is to clothe ourselves spiritually as we are encouraged and exhorted to do in the letter to the Colossians and to be persistent in our prayers to God in all of that. May God give us the, the strength and the perseverance to seek these things out. Amen. Let us continue by singing the hymn, O God in whom all life begins.
come now to this moment in our worship where we dedicate our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. Hear now the word of the Lord concerning the offering as it comes to us from Jesus' words in Luke's Gospel in chapter 12, verse 15. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of all covetousness, for a person's life does not consist of the abundance of their possessions. We will continue with our response. We give thee but thy own. with you is important to us. Accept these sacrifices as offerings given in love. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. We come now to announcements and acknowledgments for the day, celebrating birthdays this week. On this day, Larry First and coming up in the days ahead, Joey Holly, Mason Lair, Sharon's Word, Michelle Mauck, Jared Lehman, Rival Walden, Scott Marcus, Stephen Warbogle, Haley Schwantes, and Jaden Krieger. And celebrating a wedding anniversary this week are Dale and Janice Knuth on the 15th. We wish all a happy birthday and happy anniversary. The rest of the announcements I would commend to your reading and consideration. Let us now pray that prayer that Christ our Savior has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. <laughs>